Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Bible study. And we're so thankful that you are with us. Hope that you're having a wonderful week and uh, looking forward to uh, once again getting back together here in about a week and a half as uh, we'll gather the first week of May at, uh, at our 11 o'clock service. So we hope that you're making plans to be with us back together if you are able to. I wanted to say just for a moment uh, to, to remind you as you come in uh, on that Sunday, we know the last time we all met together, uh, we live in a, a much different environment. And so uh, we've got plenty of hand sanitizer. We're gonna obviously have this place really cleaned up as always, um, but you may wanna wear a mask. You wanna, may wanna wear gloves. Uh, feel free to, we're not uh, gonna judge you. Uh, look down on you or anything like that. It's certainly part of the culture uh, in which we're living right now. So uh, don't be ashamed if you have to, to wear one of those. I, I understand it. Uh, we want you to be a part of uh, what God's uh, going to do as we come back together. So, um, so again, if you have any questions about that, I actually ordered masks. We have some uh, masks. They're not here yet, uh, but they're on their way. They're due in this week. Uh, and again, we've got plenty of hand sanitizer. Uh, trying to do our part. We uh, actually separated, I separated the rows a little bit more. We took one row out. Uh, we've uh, had a few, uh, obviously we haven't been filling it up uh, as it is anyway, so maybe it'll look a little fuller, um, but I'm not sure how many are gonna be coming back right away. I do wanna remind you we're not having our fellowship luncheon that Sunday, uh, that first Sunday of May. We'll, we'll look towards the later, later part of that month uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully, hopefully be back on track for June. We'll see how it goes. Also, I want to remind our people um, that our marriage conference we have scheduled for the last week of June. Uh, sorry, the last weekend of June. I uh, forget the dates. I think it was 28th and 29th. Whatever the last Friday and Saturday of the month of June are. Uh, we only have two couples signed up right now. Of course, we invited uh, Grace Baptist Church from North Ridgeville to come along with us as well. And I think there's a few families there. Uh, but really, we've got to make some decisions on that. I want to make sure that we're still on track. So uh, if you are interested in going into that or planning on going uh, and, and did not get a chance to sign up, I know you'll have an opportunity. But if you want to email me or text me and let me know, hey, we're going to be coming, uh, uh, put us down on the list. Just so I know, uh, we have 10 rooms reserved right now. We got to make sure we hit that. Uh, that 10, 10 rooms is what we're striving for. So uh, so again, just put it out there. Uh, it is a couple hundred bucks to go. It covers the, all the food uh, as far as for uh, Friday, uh, the dinner, um, and of course all the rental facilities and the room and the, ho the hotel room, and then that dinner that night at the Farmstead restaurant, and then Saturday morning um, as well, the hotel has breakfast provided. So uh, again, just wanna put that out there so you're thinking about it, I know. Um, we haven't thought much about the church calendar because of everything going on uh, and we'll make uh, decisions as we go through on what things uh, we're going to keep uh, for right now. Now obviously you saw this past uh, weekend was supposed to be our Faith Promise Missions weekend and I had spoken to uh, Brother Carpenter who was our scheduled preacher for Saturday and Sunday. I had spoken to him a month earlier uh, or three weeks earlier whatever it was and just we made the decision to push it back. We haven't scheduled a date yet but he is still willing uh, to come and minister. Uh, of course, he's, uh, you know, I think he's in his 80s, late 70s, early 80s, so obviously there was some concern there um, with that. But, um, but that, just so you know, that, that's kind of, we're taking it uh, on a week-by-week -week basis, almost a day-by-day -day basis, but uh, certainly um, as we get back together, we'll start to, to re-implement some of those things. I don't know how soon the nursing home ministry is going to come back, uh, or the, even the Westerly ministry. I don't know how soon those are going to come back. Uh, as we're dependent upon those facilities to allow us in. So just be in prayer about all those things as, as we kind of get, get back together. Uh, really, a lot of the soul winning on Saturday is, is really up in the air, how we're going to accomplish that and do those things. I'm still praying about that. And I, I, I covet your prayers uh, as we move forward with that. And, and uh, we may just do a lot more uh, canvassing uh, than door knocking. We'll see as it goes forth. Uh, how, how it goes, but uh, but just be thinking about those things. Now we got to kind of get back into the mindset of uh, church activities and church ministries uh, collectively. I know we've been more focused individually now, uh, but just start praying about that, thinking about those things uh, as well. And church, I want to commend you as well. Uh, another great offering this week to get everything paid up. 
uh, and we praise the Lord for it. We, we have not missed anything. Uh, I, I mentioned last week, we have not put anything on hold, deferred any payments. God has been so faithful. You have been so faithful uh, in uh, keeping uh, everything going, and I praise the Lord uh, for that. Uh, so keep it up. we got uh, one more week this month, and then we got five weeks next month, and uh, just keep up your faithfulness in that area. God has provided and is providing, and we thank the Lord for that. And I just want to say real quick, I know my wife's uh, watching, uh, at least she should be watching. Uh, I, uh, today we're celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary, and I just uh, love her so much. I, I, so I thank God for her, and uh, I wouldn't be where I'm at today without God putting our lives together. And, uh, and, and, and so, honey, I love you, and I'm so thankful for you, and uh, I hope you can put up with me for another 25 years if the Lord allows. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, thank you for being my wife and a, a good godly wife for all these years. I appreciate it so much. All right, Revelation chapter 3 tonight. Revelation chapter 3. I, uh, I want to go through this, uh, this church of the Laodiceans. And I want to talk a little bit about what the church of the Laodiceans had. What the church of the La Laodiceans had. So we're going to talk about four different things that the church of the Laodiceans had. And, um, you know, I, I, many of you know I was, I'm teaching uh, Baptist history at, at the Heritage Baptist Institute. we got one week to go. Uh, but boy, I've been reminded of so many things uh, as we've been studying Baptist history about our lineage, our heritage. And uh, sometimes we don't realize that these churches that are talked about here in the book of Revelation, uh, they were all Baptist churches. I mean, Jesus started a Baptist church. I mean, it may not have said, uh, you know, First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, uh, but the fact of the matter is Baptist, uh, is a, they're identified, we're identified by the doctrine that, uh, that uh, is taught. And, and of course, we, we trace ourselves unashamedly right back to the time of Christ. We have no problem uh, seeing that church uh, Baptist perpetuity. History records uh, a lineage, not always identified by the name Baptist, but by the body of doctrine. And so um, we have to understand that, that these early churches, uh, they all stemmed from that first church in Jerusalem that Jesus started during his earthly ministry and empowered at the time of Pentecost. And then after that, uh, as, as disciples, apostles were spread, disciples were spread, uh, and of course God raised up and, and saved and raised up Paul, uh, he went about and started all those, uh, those churches. And you know, you say, well, Jesus didn't teach a lot of the things that, uh, um, um, that maybe we adhere to, you know, the Baptist distinctives. And I would, I would challenge that statement, but also remember, he taught his apostles, and we're told over and over in the epistles to remember the words of the prophets and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles' doctrine. They continued, the book of Acts, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. So what were they teaching? They were teaching what the Lord had taught them. Uh, maybe we don't have it recorded uh, in those gospels as intricately as we do in the, in the other epistles, but we do have them there. And so these were seven churches that were real churches. Um, you know, sometimes we... we, we spiritualize them sometimes and I think we do a disservice when we do that I know there's a common belief that these churches represent different church ages now the problem with that theory is it, in, it implies a universal church and the Bible doesn't teach a universal church and uh, it is a local called out assembly of baptized believers um, and, and, and it's visible and it's local it's autonomous it's self-governing and uh, every, uh, every local church uh, that, uh, that adheres to the doctrine of Christ um, and the doctrines of this Word of God, um, they are one of the Lord's churches. And, um, and so, uh, so we have these churches here. They're, they're local, they're visible, they're individual churches. And so I want to look at it from that lens tonight, from, I believe, pro the proper biblical lens tonight uh, with that in, as we look at this church of the Laodiceans. And not so much as, oh, this is going to be indicative of the times in which we live. But let's look at this church. And, and what are the attributes of this church? And what were the struggles of this church? And what were the opportunities of this church? Because this was a church. And so Revelation chapter 3 verse 14 says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans writes, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, 
the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. I mentioned this the other day. You know, God doesn't like fence straddlers. He doesn't like, and if we think we have one foot in the world and we have one foot with God, that's two feet in the world, my friend. You don't, you don't have a, a walk with God. You can't walk with God and walk with the world. He that's friend of the world is an enemy of God. So you got to choose one or the other. It's like Elijah said, well, halt, why halt you between two opinions? Uh, choose one or choose the other. Choose Baal or choose God, but, but get off the fence. And so Laodicea appears to be a fence straddling church. It says, uh, because then, uh, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to be together. We thank you for the faithfulness of our church body, Lord, but I thank you for your faithfulness. For the Bible reminds us, uh, both in word and in our hearts, that faithful is he that calleth you and he will also do it. And Lord, we know that you are always faithful and we thank you for that. And uh, we pray tonight, Lord, you'll give us insight. You'll reveal to us the truth of these scriptures, that we would see what it says, not what it teaches, but what it says. And the Holy Spirit would have free reign to, to move and teach us what we need to hear for our own lives tonight. Bless those that are with us. If there's any unsaved, Lord, may they come to you in repentance and faith. For those who are saved, Lord, may we be not guilty of the charges against this church. And Lord, may we, uh, if we are, may we see the open door tonight, uh, at least the one knocking at the door, Lord, and open it up, that he would come in and sup with us once again. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing. We pray for our nation tonight. We pray for our leaders, Lord. We pray for our people. There's a lot of unrest going on, Lord. And uh, may we be uh, faithful to the scriptures and our response as, uh, as this thing unfolds and moves forward, Lord. And we seek your glory, we seek your honor, we seek your favor. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll help our leaders uh, to make uh, right decisions, that you give them the strength to do what's right. I heard of a politician today, Lord. Uh, he uh, identifies as a, a Democrat, but he has left, he is gone. He is, uh, he is tired of, uh, of putting party above country. And Lord, we need, uh, we need more people like that. And I don't know really much about them, but. Uh, I'm thankful that somebody acknowledged the truth today and uh, is more concerned about truth than they are uh, their own feelings and their own, uh, their own profit. So, Lord, I pray that you'll bless him and bless others, Lord, and help us, Lord, to live according to the truth. May our loins be girt about with truth tonight. And, Lord, we just love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, I want to go through these four things real quick. Um, uh, the infamous words of a Baptist preacher real quick, I know. Um, what were the things that the church of the Laodiceans had? And let me give you the first one here that we see that this church, this Laodicean church had, or the church of the Laodiceans. Number one, they had an indifference. They had an indifference in their service to the Lord. They had an indifference in their service to the Lord. We find here in verses 15 and 16, uh, the Bible says, Jesus says, I know thy works. Uh, you know, I hope you realize God knows your works tonight. Uh, you know, sometimes we can talk really good that we're, we're, we're doing the works of the Lord. We can talk up a good testimony. But the reality is God knows our works. He knows whether it's real or not. He knows whether it's hot or cold. He knows the in-between. He knows the fence travelers. He knows those are red hot. He knows that are cold. And by the way, he says it's better to be cold than it is to be lukewarm. 
It doesn't say the cold one gets spewed out of the mouth. You know, most of us, we like drinking something that's cold or we like drinking something that's hot, but something that's lukewarm is not very appetizing. And, uh, and so we see here there was an indifference in their service to the Lord. He says, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of, their, out of, out of my mouth. What does the word indifference mean? It means the neutrality of mind between different persons or things. A state in which the mind is not inclined to one side more than the other. I think you'll find there's two areas in which this, this church was indifferent. And number one, they were indifferent in their love. In their love. Um, they, they had uh, gotten cold or lukewarm in their in their love. The Bible says the love of many shall wax cold because of iniquity. So it's iniquity that dampers that down. And, but in this particular case, there's, there's not a really a difference in love. They, they don't see the intensity or the constraining of God's love as, as something essential. And they're kind of indifferent to it. Well, if I got it, great. If I don't have it, great. There's an indifference in their love. There's an indifference in their life. The way that they're living, they could uh, really take it or leave it, the, the Christian living, um, the, uh, the, the, the abstinence, the, the temperance, the patience, the virtue, the, the knowledge, uh, the godliness. They could kind of take it or leave it. Well, if I got it, great. If I don't have it, great. They're kind of a, just an indifferent to it. Their indifference in their love and in their life. If you hold your place here and go over to 2 Timothy, I, I think you'll see Paul talk about this in 2 Timothy. When it says... Uh, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now watch the indifference of somebody's love here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I like this one. This one totally identifies the, the, the days in which we're living without natural affection, without natural affection. Um, that is indicative of today um, in all kind of uh, 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 um, uh, relationships, in societal ills, uh, all kinds of things. Um, you talk about uh, homosexual marriage or same-sex marriage, that's without natural affection. You say, why would you say that, preacher? Because Romans chapter 1 tells us it is contrary to nature. So it's, it's natural for a man to lust after a woman, and it's natural for a woman to lust after a man. But what is unnatural is a man to lust after a man and a woman to lust after a woman. That is unnatural. That goes against nature, the Bible says. And so uh, talk about abortion. I mean, mothers killing their children? I mean, that, that, that goes against natural affection. You that are mothers, you couldn't even dream of doing it. You couldn't even think of doing it. You love your children so much, you, you'd give your own, you, you would die first to give your life for the children. It's unnatural for a mother to want to kill her children. It's unnatural for a man to want to kill his children. It's unnatural for, for, for all kinds of these social ills and, and uh, relationship issues and all kinds of things without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. I'm just saying they're indifferent. They're indifferent in their love. And maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you can go, well, okay, we get back. Uh, some of you are beating down the door to get here. And praise the Lord for that. That's not an indifferent love. That's a passionate love. Some of you may never decide to come back. That's an indifference in your love. You have to decide and say, well, look, what's, what's going on? I don't think it's going to happen. I think most of us are probably all going to congregate. Some are going to hold off a little bit, rightfully so. They're a little older. They need to take a few more precautions. The data does show that it hits the older people a little bit more, the elderly people. That's understandable. Those that are compromised, that's understandable. But boy, I hope you're not indifferent in your love and indifferent in the way that you live. This church was. This church had an indifference. They were lukewarm. That's, that's indifferent. They weren't either hot or cold. This kind of reminds me of James chapter 1, the double-minded man. See, what happens is we can convince ourselves that God is indifferent in certain matters, and he's not. 
Some of us have an idea, well, it's not a big deal if I read my Bible or not. It's not a big deal if I pray or not. It's not a big deal if I miss church or not. It's not a big deal if I give my tithe or not. It's not a big deal if I share Christ or not. But all those things matter to God. And God's not indifferent in those areas. He's very instructive. Sometimes I think we confuse liberty and liberalism. I know you hear liberalism, you think politically right now. But the Bible condemns, you know, the Bible says that the liberals shall be no more called violent. I think it's Isaiah 32, once the kingdom comes. Um, what is liberalism? It's free thinking, free of heart. I can do whatever I want to do. That's, that's the essence of liberalism. It's all relative. I can do what I want to do. What is liberty? Liberty is doing what I ought to do, not what I want to do. That's the difference between liberty and liberal. Liberty says we got to do what we ought to do. Liberal says, no, we want to do what we want to do. And people, that happens in, in churches. And so they're indifferent in their surface, uh, service to the Lord. That's number one. Let me give you number two quickly. Not only did they have an indifference in their service to the Lord, they had an inability to see their spiritual needs. They had an inability to, spirit, to see their spiritual needs. There's three things about this. Number one, they had a wrong evaluation of their needs. Look what it says there. It says in verse 17, they have need of nothing. You know, one preacher said one time, the, the most dangerous time in a Christian's life is when all of their needs are met. It's amazing how many have slipped down the slippery slope of backsliding and going backwards because all of their financial needs have been met. All of their physical needs have been met. And all of a sudden, there's not a dependence upon the Lord anymore. Maybe that's why the Lord said it's very hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's very hard for them to do it. Why? Because what's their need of Christ? They can write a check. They can go to the bank. They, they pay in gold. They probably pay in silver. All of their needs are met. So, so what do they need to be saved for? They had an inability to see their, their needs. And they had a wrong evaluation of the needs. Uh, they said, I am rich and increased with goods. They had a wrong estimation of their blessings. You know, everything that God does is good. Now, I was thinking about this. When we get saved, we are increased with goods too. Now, I know what this is talking about. This is talking about physical things, earthly things, earthly material things, treasures upon this earth. So they were increased with that and they thought, man, we got to be right with God because God's blessing us financially and physically. So, man, God wouldn't bless us financially or physically if, if we weren't living right. Well, that's a wrong mentality, my friends. Sometimes we reap the benefits of the previous generation's uh, sowing of blessings uh, and we're reaping the abundance of their labors. That's how the founders set it up, by the way. They wanted us. We're, we're losing sight of that. We've lost sight of that. What they sacrificed their fortunes, uh, as it tells us in the Declaration of Independence, we're spending the fortunes of future generations. It's a wrong estimation of blessings. They were increased with worldly goods, not God's goods. What are God's goods? Well, the Bible tells us good works, tells us good will, tells us good news, tells us good cheer, good comfort, good fruit, good things, good pleasure. They weren't increased with those things. Those goods, they were increased with worldly goods. And so they had a wrong estimation of their blessings. And part of the problem was this. They had a wrong elevation of their own importance. Boy, we live in a world today, people think they're so important today. There is one person that is most important today, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the important one, the most important and the ultimate important, the preeminence of all importance belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and remember that. Don't elevate. The Bible says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. The Bible says we're to esteem others more uh, than ourselves and better than ourselves. But so often today, this, this church here, and many churches today, they elevate their own importance. You know what I found out in life? If you just do what's right, God will put you and elevate you when and where he needs you to be elevated so that he can get the glory. The, the reason he doesn't trust in man and in flesh is because we seek our own glory. We want to make a name for ourselves. 
We want to get our, our picture on the paper. We want to get on the news. We want to get our, our letter written. We want to get our article published. We want to get our book published. We want to get our name out there. This church was seeking their own, uh, their own glory. And they had a wrong elevation of their own importance. So they had an inability to see. Let me give you the third one quickly. They had an indeterminate amount of time spent with the Lord. They had an indeterminate amount of time spent with the Lord. The word indeterminate means not determinate, not settled or fixed, not definite, uncertain, as an un indeterminate number of years, not certain, not precise. You know, one of the great things about da Daniel, when we read the story of Daniel, one of the great stories is the, the time that he got cast into the lion's den and God preserved him that night. But one of the reasons he got cast into the lion's den is because he didn't allow the laws of the land, the mandates of the king, um, to alter his going home every day. The windows were always open to the east. The Bible says that was his custom. He didn't throw them all open and say, well, I'm going to show this king. I'm going to show these guys. It was already done. Just like he did every day, every morning, every afternoon, every evening. He sat at that window and he prayed to the God of heaven. And, uh, and, 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 and he had a determinate amount of time. He knew every day I'm going to spend it now, now, and now I'm going to spend it with the Lord. This church didn't have that. You say, well, how do you know that, preacher? Where does it say that in here? Well, look at verse number 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What, who's talking there? Jesus is talking there. What does that mean? That means Jesus is outside the door of the church. And everybody else was congregated within the church and they were singing and they were uh, fellowshipping and they were ha having a good time. And, but where was Jesus? He was outside the door. They weren't spending any time with Jesus. He wasn't even in the assembly. He wasn't even there with them. He's standing outside the door trying to get in where he belongs. And why? Because people don't spend time with Jesus. How much time have you spent with Jesus today? How much time have you spent in prayer? How much time have you spent in your Bible? Spending time communing with God. They hit an indeterminate amount. They had a lack of fellowship with Christ. They had a love of friendship with the world. They loved worldly things. Man, I'll tell you, there's a lot of joy in giving, isn't there? I mean, if you've not learned that yet, uh, uh, recently our, chur uh, our, our church, well, our church has been doing fine too, but uh, our, in our personal life, we have had some people give us some gifts. Of course, we got some of the stimulus money back. And boy, I'll tell you, my wife and I, first thing we did said, all right, who can we try to be a blessing to? Man, we just love to give. We want to give because you know what? All that stuff's going to go by the wayside anyway. And there's just something with knowing you're helping to provide. People have done it my whole life, provided for us. And what, man, it's such a blessing to know you're providing and God's using you to help people out. And it's just such a blessing uh, to do that uh, and, and, and because it, it meets so many needs in people's lives. It does uh, uh, meet those needs and help with those things. But I tell you, that's not Christianity. That's not what it's all about. May we never forget that our Lord and Savior had not a pillow to put his head on. He said the foxes even have holes and the birds have nests. But I don't even have a pillow to put my head on. I'm going to rely on people every night. They had a love of the friendship with the world. They loved the world's things. You know, time is the, if not other than salvation itself, time is one of the greatest gifts God's given to us. The Bible tells us to number our days. Number our days. The Bible says today, harden not your heart if you hear his voice. The Bible says today is the accepted time, the day of salvation. The Bible says today is the day to awake, for your salvation is nearer today than yesterday. I'm just saying that they looked at their time and they used it very selfishly for themselves and not for the Lord. And so Jesus is literally outside the door knocking. Hey guys, can I come on in? I mean, it sounds ludicrous. It sounds crazy that that's even taking place. But I wonder how many churches, uh, and may our church never be guilty of leaving Jesus outside the door and we go on with our service. That's not going to be a very productive service. 
They had an indeterminate amount of time spent with the Lord. Let me give you the last one here. The, 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 what the church of the Laodiceans had. They had an indifference in their service. They had an inability to see their spiritual needs. They had an indeterminate amount of time spent with the Lord. But let me give you the last one. They had an invitation to open the door and let Jesus back in. They had an invitation to open the door and let Jesus back in. They had to hear him knocking. Hey, who's knocking out there? It sounds like they were just oblivious that he was even knocking at the door. They had no idea he's standing out there. They were totally, the Bible says they were blind and wretched and they were naked. And, and uh, he says, buy the eye cell so it'll, it'll fix your eyesight so you can see things properly. And you'll hear the knocking at the door. You'll listen uh, to the rebuke and, to, and endure the chastening of God. We, you, you, you must open that door. Uh, listen to that. Repent immediately. The Bible says there in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. So what is repentance? It's acknowledging the truth. Acknowledging the truth, accepting the punishment for your iniquities, Leviticus, I think, 28. Amending your ways and your doings in Jeremiah and avenge your sin in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's the process of repentance right there. To acknowledge the truth, accept the punishment for your iniquities, amend your ways and your doings, and avenge your sin. That's the only thing we're allowed to avenge is our sin. According to 1 Corinthians 7, I believe it is. We must respond to his voice. And listen, we must open the door and let him in. If you're listening tonight and you don't have a walk with God, Jesus, if you're saved, Jesus is standing outside that door. Why don't you open the door up and let him back in? And tell him you're sorry for, for fence straddling. Tell him you're sorry for walking with one foot in the world or thinking one foot in the world and one foot with God. But in all reality, you've been living disobediently. Tell him you're sorry. He's willing to come in and sup with you. He's willing to come in and fellowship with you. He's willing to forgive you and extend mercy and, and renew you and clean you up and, and give you that new lease again, that new light again uh, within you that you can go do the right thing. But you've got to open the door. You gotta open the door. Maybe you're listening tonight for the first time. God's knocking at the door of your heart saying, you know what, you need to let me in for salvation. You don't even know that you're saved. Why don't you open the door? And why don't you acknowledge the truth with the Lord and say, yeah, I'm, I'm a sinner. I deserve uh, to die and I deserve to go to hell because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Lord, I want that gift. I want the gift of forgiveness. I want the gift of salvation. Would you please forgive me and save me? And God will save you, because if you call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. If your heart is seeking the Lord, and God is, by the way, you can only do that if the Lord pricks in your heart the need for salvation. And so you begin to seek after him, and you will find him. And that's opening the door. But to the Christian, how's your walk with God? I know I'm talking to several people tonight. You're on fire for God. You're doing incredible things for God. Man, keep it up. Keep spending time with the Lord. Increase that determinate time that you spend with the Lord. And that'll take care of everything else. You'll have the right eyesight. You'll have the right mindset. You'll have the right abilities and, and actions in your life. What the Church of the Laodiceans had, they weren't known for, for anything good. Um, they did work. They had works, but their works were lukewarm. They were indifferent. They had an inability. They were indeterminate. But God still loved him. He was still there knocking at the door. Hey, hey, I'm still here. I haven't forgotten about you. But I'm here with you. Let me in. Some of you need to let Jesus in tonight back into your life. And I hope that you will. If you're not saved, well, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to help you. You can call us here at the church, 216-521-3800. You can email us. At, go to the website and hit the contact button. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. love to help you. We need prayer, give us a call. We'd love to pray with you. But boy, open that door tonight. Let Jesus back in and uh, spend some time with him. And uh, you won't regret it, that's for sure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had together. Uh, thank you for the testimony of this church, Lord, that we can learn from tonight. And Lord, we don't want to be too harsh on them because I'm sure that uh, there are churches, maybe even our church at times, has uh, patterned some of this Laodicean church. I hope not, Lord. I hope that we're uh, ones that are not having you standing outside the door, 
uh, uh, knocking, but that you're in with us, Lord. And we thank you that when we're living right, we know that to be true. And we thank you, Lord. And I pray for those who might not be saved tonight. I pray that you'll save them before it's eternally too late, Lord, that they would open their hearts up and ask for salvation. And Lord, I pray you'll encourage the brethren tonight. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. Pray uh, again. Uh, Sunday we'll be here at 11 o'clock live streaming. And so be praying about that service. Gather some people around. Tell them about it. Let's see how many people we can get watching. And uh, we'll preach the word of God faithfully and see what God can do. So I hope you have a great rest of the week. God bless you. Have a great night.